And yeah, tonight again, hi there. We're going to return to old path white clouds. It's such an, ex yeah, I'll do a longer preamble as I generally do. Such an exciting time in the book right now. There's like a really sweet moment. So for those of you who haven't been following with us, we're, we're using this book, Old Past White Clouds, as a way to do kind of like story time together. Um, it's a really sweet and beautiful um, translation of these ancient fragments of stories about the historical Buddha's life. So we're kind of tracking with him. It goes forward and backward in time a little bit, but we're in this pretty steady uh, component of the book in which we're really tracking young Siddhartha from his early life to when he leaves his home. And he has just made that incredible journey of leaving home and really trying so hard to do so with integrity, you know, trying to tell people I, I am leaving and I love you and I'm leaving because I love you and getting all the amounts of um you know blame and uh at all costs trying to manipulate him to stay and yet he he makes his way and he's in the forest and the last time we are with him is his first his very first afternoon in the forest and I remember, and maybe you remember this beautiful description of the sunlight coming through his eyelids, just kind of feeling that sense of calm and peace, having successfully really made this bold move from his conventional daily life into seeking. He has no idea how long it will take. We know but he has no idea and he doesn't know where to start. And it's just a, yeah, really beautiful part of this book. And what we'll be covering tonight is the first teachings that he's receiving um, from the great masters in uh, the lands near him. And again, I like to try to create the equivalencies of our contemporary time. Uh, there are probably a handful of Buddhist centers open tonight that we could all be going to. Certainly many in the Bay Area and, you know, him seeking out these different teachers and these different wisdoms and a little bit of a spoiler alert, but he discovers that he actually can't learn it all from the wisdom that's being offered. He can learn quite a lot, but then he has to go on his own into the woods and find that discovery for himself which is, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not encouraging you all to leave here and go to the woods right now. But I, I like that idea of how important it is for us to feel responsibility and ownership and empowered in our practice. Like we are learning a lot from these teachings, these incredible books that have been given to us and um, all the different ways we can hear these ideas that can really light us up. And it's up to us. The practice is alive in us. Some of you already know um, that the Buddha, he never wrote down anything and actually didn't want anyone to record the teachings. He figured that if they were recorded and written, they would become stale and die. And it was a living practice. And so it's, it's interesting to think about how do we make that a living practice? I think, unfortunately, by default, maybe it's a human condition thing. Maybe our contemporary culture, we like a doctrine. Like, tell us what to do, how to follow it. Like, I want to get, I want to go through that checklist. And I think what we see, especially in these chapters, is how much he recognizes that's not a possibility. You know, you really have to take these teachings and make them alive in yourself. So the practice we'll, we're going to start with tonight, a meditation, kind of, it will be picking up on some of the themes that we're reading about. And, you know, I think it's, it's always nice to go or maybe not go back to, but re-experience some of the foundations of practice. And one thing I've noticed in my own kind of personal exploration of especially meditation techniques that are subtle and simple, like following the breath, when we're sitting down, like our very first moment of sitting down to practice, there is a lot else going on. Some of us are coming in the door, right? And like, oh God, and, you know, other of us have like had a whole day. And 
how do we actually enter our practice and not make it feel forced? So when I sit by myself, just doing my own practice, I start with a quite a long time of the handshake practice. Some of you have done that with me before. And that's really a sense of just meeting what is here in the body. That's like our emotional residue from the day. <clears throat> so what have we experienced today and how is that showing up at the embodied level? And I've noticed that when we can attend to the body and kind of give ourselves that entryway, then it gets a little easier to follow the breath. Still, we're going to be distracted, you know, and carried away, but to just keep coming back. Um, it's a really, it's a really nice way to start is through the body. And I'll actually guide us through a couple different techniques of the breath, just to try to make that even a bit more subtle. And then invite us to this practice, uh, such a sweet practice. Um, Peggy and I were together last week in the training where uh, my, my co-teacher Ryan loves this practice of harvesting joy. And that's a practice in which we just notice what's already in our field that feels good, joyful. And it's such an important part of our practice to kind of feel the benefit, to feel that, wow, there is a wellspring internally that's actually a source of kind of contentment, a deep contentment. So it's just very like it's a such a different way of orienting instead of looking outwards to the world of what's the next thing that's going to make me feel good. Like, what can we really kind of cultivate or experience at an inner level that feels good and to feel confidence in that? Not as a concept, right, that happiness is an inside job or comes from within, but to feel that like, what is it like to feel that sense of joy internally? So um, before we get started, please feel free to grab a blanket or a cushion if you like for your practice or to put under your feet. Friends at home, get your furry animals on your lap so that you can have greatest ease. Coco, I hope, is there with you. Good. And as we're settling in, just a really warm welcome to folks to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. This is an entirely volunteer run center and just a unique place to get to practice together, to experience these teachings and uh, build community. And so I'm, I'm Eve, your teacher for this evening. And I teach here also with uh, Lopan Chandra Easton. And, you know, our goal in, in this work and especially in being able to teach in community is to experience a sense of the living practice, right? Like learning about these teachings, trying them on through practice and then discussing them. And to do so kind of every time that we constellate together, we create a community and a community based in some shared principles, primarily non-harming, non-harming to ourselves, non-harming to others, as much as possible while here, see if you can ease up on any self-critical thoughts. Probably most of us, our greatest harmful activity on a day-to-day -day basis, if you tally it up, is self-criticism. And then also extending that to the rest of us in this room. So if someone raises their hand and shares, as much as possible, loosening or being gentle with criticism, judgment, we just don't know, right? So many folks in here, many of us have never met. So really exercising our mindfulness and compassion as we're in community here together. Always at the Dharma Collective, we're interested in figuring out ways to make this space feel more welcoming, more joyful. If you have suggestions, we are totally open to it. You can absolutely tell me. You can also tell Cage, Mace, there's other board members, Brendan, Dean in the room. So... Before we start, can we just see who here is a board member volunteer here? Thank you for making it possible for us to be here. And um, with your generosity, we'll move into a sit for tonight. <clears throat>
Let's give ourselves a moment to find a posture that feels supportive. And almost inviting a sense of the symbolic support of our posture. So feeling the ground beneath your feet, maybe lifting the heels and toes and connecting to that imaginary earth just below us. And feeling that sense of the upright spine lifting up. Inviting the head to just be gently resting on the top of the neck, not pointed too far forward or sloping backward. And a deep, deep, deep softening through the muscles in the face. Feel or imagine just an openness at the area of the heart, a slight tilt upward, and a sense that for the moment, we can freely experience the heart. Turn our attention there, invite a softness and gentleness. And feel the groundedness of the belly. Our stable base. And as part of our arriving here in the body and posture, really igniting the sense of what we are here for. We can share just the beautiful purity of this awakening of our heart for the sake of all beings.
Continuing to explore the experience of the body, we move into this handshake practice of noticing what might be here as a residue from the day. As much as possible, not thinking it through, but feeling, noticing heaviness, noticing ache, maybe weariness, maybe delight. And in the handshake practice, we simply meet and notice what we're experiencing in the body and bring kind attention. We may not even know what is the cause of the sensation in the body. We may simply experience something heavy or weighty. Or we may feel the imprint of uncertainty, insecurity, overwhelm. And just allowing the sensations of these experiences to be met and feeling or imagining that there's as much space as they need to unfold and unwind all on their own. We don't need to have any agenda, pushing them away, soothing them, simply meeting and making space. We may simply notice an area of the body we can't feel. Maybe we're encountering some kind of blockage. And we can also breathe that kind of tension there. The goal here is simply bringing the entire body, heart and mind online really feeling the full aliveness of what's here in this moment, making space for all that is here.
when the mind gets captured by another thought, memory, or image, just gently return. Release what has captured your attention and notice, has anything shifted in the body? Again, with this intent of kindness and openness and fusing any of the felt experience in the body. These imprints of the mind and emotion throughout the body. A couple more moments here, just allowing ourselves again to feel what we are often carrying or suppressing or avoiding or denying. At that felt level in the body, the imprints from our day, conversations, interactions, giving ourselves this space here to meet and transform, inviting a release wherever possible. More and more space, gentle, gentle kindness of our attention. Gently shifting from this practice of shaking hands to bringing our attention more fully to the breath. And breathing in, really knowing and feeling that we are breathing in with the whole body. Breathing out, knowing and feeling that we are breathing out with the whole body. Allowing the simplicity of this instruction to capture our entire attention and awareness, breath by breath.
consider the possibility that this could be the most important thing you've done today. Simply breathing in and knowing you are breathing in. Breathing out, knowing you are breathing out the whole body. And as you're breathing in and breathing out, you may naturally notice that some of the breaths are longer or shorter. And we can continue to bring this inspiration of giving our full attention to the breath by noticing when the breath is long, noticing when the breath is a bit shorter. These simple practices tending to our breath, they're the foundation for the training of the mind, heart, and body. They are the essential ingredient. They can even be our entire path. Bringing that level of motivation for the simple instruction. Noticing when the breath is longer, noticing when the breath is shorter. And any time we become distracted, whether through th thought or sensation or sound, we consider even a sense of rejoicing, recognizing that the attention has wandered and returning, refreshing your interest in the simple practice. Noticing the breath, 
and feeling the sense of whether the breath is long or short. Becoming so close and intimate with each breath. while still maintaining most of our attention and awareness on the breath. We can gently explore this practice of harvesting joy. It can seem that joy is not something we experience in subtle practice, but we can find subtle joy or a sense of goodness or even just okayness. As we're following the breath, noticing, is there a sense of being okay? Maybe a sense of peace or contentment. Not because of thinking of anything in particular, just the joy of being. a simple unconfigured sense of okayness of attending to our breath gently You don't have to generate something that isn't here or reveal a sense that is likely always already there of being okay, being deeply well. And to harvest that, we just allow some of our attention and awareness to recognize or feel that sense of goodness or joy as we continue to gently follow the breath.
keep coming back, keep coming back. Every time the attention has wandered and find that inspiration, maybe even that rejoicing of coming home to the breath and noticing again, if that spark of joy or goodness can simply be felt through each inhale and each exhale, feeling it through the body, through the heart, through the mind. And if it's accessible, really noticing and feeling and savoring this sense of goodness or joy. Not the kind of joy that we feel when something good happens or we receive something. But a primordial sense of joy and goodness. The joy of a baby, the joy of us when we temporarily forget ourselves and our worries. It's finding that simple joy as we follow our breath. Gently releasing the focus on the breath and giving ourselves some time here in a more spacious awareness. Awareness through the whole body, mind, and heart. Thank you for your practice.
thank you for your joy. Any questions or comments on that practice? Or reflections. Are you just too blissed out? Yeah, really curious. How how did that land for you all? Or what what did you notice? Oh great. Do you mind using this mic? Here, thank you so much. You can stand using it. Yeah, I'm sharing because no one else is sharing. It, does I, this work? I think so. Can they? It's for the people online. Yeah. Can you all hear Diane? Can you hear her through that yeah. mic? Yeah, and um, Claudia has her hand up. Can you see people's okay, hands up, Eve? I can now that I'm looking. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, please. Um, thanks for leading us through that. By the way, it was super lovely and helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I normally sit um, on a safu when I meditate. And so I found myself very relaxed in this chair. <laughs> and so it was so hard for me to focus with mm. attention because my posture was so fully relaxed. Yeah. I almost started, you know, it falling into daydreams. Yeah. When I shifted forward, I found that it was much more helpful in yes. maintaining my posture yep. and just being able to focus. But I, I did struggle a lot tonight with just falling into these thoughts. I had a really difficult conversation right before coming here and it just, my mind was just grasping. Yeah. It kept going back, but it was such a nice um, moment when mm. you asked us to invite joy and it really did bring me back mm. to the presence and mm. the joy that does exist without, you know, grasping. Yeah. Because you're right. There is this subtle like beauty and openness to life when you pay attention to it or not yeah. open to it. So that, that was a really nice reminder. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks for sharing. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and posture is, it's huge. And especially if we're used to that upright position, you know, we can lean back in the chair and get really dull and really lethargic. Playing with that hypnagogic state though, is pretty interesting, right? When we're kind of falling into daydream or to sleep, it's, it's really, it's, it can be a kind of a potent practice time. Um, obviously taking a nap is great, but if we can play with that momentary refreshment, like we can actually fall asleep in a longer practice and wake up again and noticing all those subtle state shifts, it's very rich, you know, and being, and it's so interesting because I don't know your experience, so often when I'm having that kind of hypnagogic sleepy state, it's like a full blown, like movie scene will happen for a moment, you know, just like all, and, and then coming back. And so just being able to track and notice the different states and even noticing the shifts in the body. So there's, there's always something you can harvest with it. And, and yeah, it is, it's so hard to sit and practice after a hard conversation, after a hard day, you know, it's, and so doing that, so I did a little bit of that like handshake practice, but it's, it's just really, um, I think it's still definitely worthwhile to sit after difficult material, but to almost treat it like a very different practice, you know, not that oh, I'm going to sit, it's going to be clear, but realizing, oh, I'm going to watch the mind that wants to grasp. Um, so thank you for sharing with us. Yeah. Yes, I think Claudia and then, yeah. Hi, Claudia. Oh, we can't hear you for some reason. Perfect. Now we can hear you. Okay. Um, no, I... I... Uh, several things. I really enjoyed what you said uh, 
I mean, to doing the handshake of the body when you said just give it spaciousness and not uh, don't try to fix anything or whatever, you know, just let it be. And that felt uh, so good, you know, really kind of letting the body expand. And the other thing, when you reminded us of like, the most important thing that we may have done today is like really focusing on the breath in and out. And uh, I don't always remember, but I know that when I do pay attention, I just, the whole process, I find it so, so amazing and so sacred. You know, it's like I feel it's life, it's life, you know, so thank you, that was lovely. And uh, I, I just had a question though, which doesn't relate necessarily, I mean, exactly to today's practice, but I was absent last week, but I did uh, attend last week's um, sessions with you two, and uh, where you uh, led us through a meditation of noticing the pleasant and pleasant and neutral. And I was just wondering if the purpose was to kind of like detach from these subjective labeling, if you think, if you want, of like what is what is pleasant or pleasant, I and mean, if that's kind of tied to our me, mine, I, mm -hmm. ego or whatever, and, and, and the purpose was to, to eventually just be totally neutral. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I was curious about that. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. Yeah, first of all, yeah, I, I love you highlighting um, this idea that possibly paying attention to our breath could be the most important thing we do today, um, which is provocative, right? We've, many of us done a lot of other things that we deem important. Um, and yet, you know, the breath and like training our mind with the breath, that's preparing us for everything. And this, making this whole experience of of awareness like serviceable truly it is it's it's unbelievably important and i think it can be so easy for me at least with mindfulness of breathing to be like yeah yeah okay like doing it i know i gotta do it but like no it is extremely important you know extremely important there is not there is there's no shortcut for the benefits that it creates for us. So it's so I like that that vigor. I need it. And then your second question is on the practice we did last week, which was really kind of starting to to notice more deeply how we attribute something as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, right? In our in our in all of our sensory inputs. And the question is, is the goal to be neutral or to, and, and I think it's, um, or the question is really, you know, is that relating to kind of our reification and sense of self? Absolutely. Like our identification was like, I don't like that. I like that. As opposed to recognizing the phenomena just as it is. Right. Oh yeah, that's just that car alarm, right? Um, I do think, it, I don't think we can detach because as many of us notice doing the practice, it's so fast. I remember your description last week of, you know, holding groceries, waiting for the bus, grocery bag empty, like rips, you know, bus goes by and you had like a gap of like, oh, maybe this is funny. But for most of us, it's like immediately like, <laughs> you know, like this sucks. So we can, it's the phenomenon, you know, but, and notice our judgment on it. Maybe not get stuck there, but I, I doubt we can get super neutral. Like that's, that's so high of a level of practice and, and so hard for the automaticity that we are familiar with that we use every day. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Alina? Yeah. Yes, please, if you don't mind. Yeah. 
I, I always judge my meditation at night because I go into a dream state and often it becomes a power nap and not a meditation. Yeah. And it's been like that for seven years. And I always judge myself for like checking out. Yeah. And so thank you for saying that it could be very rich to be in that hazy state and then have the consciousness of like yes. coming out of the yes. state. So tonight, as usual, I was in a very cloudy space and I could hear your voice in the background. And whenever you said pure joy, I would see my dog's face. Like, oh. right front, like very animated. I mean, she's very animated as it is. But it's almost like that word joy is so connected to her mm. that it just became really bright, mm. really sharp mm. in the haziness of everything else. Huh. And I thought that was really um unexpected yeah right like i'm always struggling through the haze and also i changed my posture and leaned forward yeah i tried to open my eyes um but just the the word joy is so connected to her mm. beautiful oh it's so sweet Thank yeah you could you feel it in the body too or was it it, it was exhilarating mm. when i would see her face yeah connected to the word like the, the word joy like literally like brought me into like total awareness of her animated face yeah yeah amazing <laughs> yeah that is and you know of course like our, the words for us have so much connotation uh, i recently watched inside out again uh, and so i was thinking of joy the character so there definitely can be these associations and it is interesting you know to use almost like these supports right we definitely do that in loving kindness we use the people who are easy for us to ignite it i think this idea of that fact that that joy is already in you even though it's kind of being it's evoking this image just just to play with that right because i yes our 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 beloved um pets and other beings in our life can create such joy and the joy is already in us so just as an invitation yeah. thank you so yeah yeah for that yeah clarity yeah absolutely um, so when it comes to analytical meditation i um i know why i'm doing it and i see the benefits when it comes to let's say meditation after a difficult conversation or a difficult day that is also clear it's kind of an offloading and you know um when it comes to shamatha, for example, with um, short durations, let's say, um, that is also clear because um, insights come in, you know, mm. off the cushion and on the cushion. Mm. But when it comes to very long shamatha practices, like let's say very consistent or very long, let's say two hours per day and then for eight days, you know, in a retreat or things like that, um, Sometimes I get lost that uh, why I'm doing it. Yeah. Especially, you know, the rates, you know, the ratio of insights to the number of hours on the cushion, you know, becomes lower. So then, uh, so then what is it that um, one is looking for? Yeah. Well, gosh, I wish I could channel um, Alan Wallace right here. <laughs> Um, who literally has written the book on shamatha, at least at least one. Um, I really recommend his book that's for the general public called The Attention Revolution. And in this book, he goes through the nine stages of shamatha. So all the phases of practice that we can do to develop our single pointed attention. And when he first started talking to me about shamatha, I was like, boring, like for sure. God, I hope he never watches this. Um, I don't think he will. Um, but, you know, it, it is like there's a monotony and actually the insights, they're not the point right insights are so important along along the course of our practice and actually that's what we'll look at tonight is the insights um siddhartha has as he's developing concentration and these concentrative practices the purpose is actually it's really subtle um and i think especially on long-term retreat we feel and have an understanding through our experience of the clarity 
you know, and the shamatha, I, I feel like it's, um, so shamatha, if folks don't know that term, is just focused attention practice. Um, that's, you know, our shamatha. And we can do a shamatha practice with the breath. We can do a shamatha practice with a stick, with like pretty much anything, focusing, sustained attention. Um, and then there are these stages of development with it all the way up to nine. But I think when we're thinking of the benefits of shamatha, it's developing that, that relaxed clarity, right? So not just relaxed, relaxed is, relaxed is great, but like a vivid, clear, relaxed. It's something most of us have no training doing whatsoever and, and barely experience. Most of our day, we're like, I'm clear, I'm focused, like we're doing our thing, not relaxed. Then maybe we come home and we're like relaxed, but super dull, right? So how do we get that clear relaxation? And that's really what shamatha is like kind of moving us towards. And according to Alan and all of um, the great masters who he is bringing forth their wisdom, like shamatha is the foundation, even for our discursive practices or other analytic meditations, because if we can't have a stable base of our attention, it's like, it's, it's like, you know, pouring water into a bucket with a hole in it. We're just not going to be able to hold these practices. And even though it's, again, can feel really monotonous, developing that stable attention, it can be used to direct our attention where we want it to anywhere. It's probably the most Jedi-like skill in all of Buddhist practice, right? I can just decide I'm going to focus here and keep my attention there. Like that is hard. Most of us, like we can do that for a little bit and then it's like, right. And so that stable focused attention and that clarity. Yeah, that makes some sense. Is there a quick follow-up? Is there a burnout from Shamata or like could it be that uh, I'm not balancing out with other types of meditation? Great, great question. So one of the very often forgotten instructions of Shamata is relax. <laughs> and almost literally, almost 90% percent of the questions I got to teach with Alan for 10 years. So I have heard him many times, but um, whenever people ask him a question, 90% of the time, his answer is, ah, relax more. Right. So there's really, and not relax, like get dull, but what he calls like this existential relaxation and doing that handshake practice as we did leading in that invites that kind of relaxation a relaxing, not just of like, uh, I'm like zoning out, but like I am making space for everything that's here. Ah, I can really be here. And so with our shamatha, we can get really tight. Uh, my teacher, my teacher friend I mentioned earlier, uh, Ryan says he has a little like a crease in between his forehead from over efforting on shamatha for a couple of years. So I just like, Ooh. Um, I've never done that. It might be a little gendered, maybe not. Um, but I think that relaxation, right? Like balancing with the relaxation is really key. So great question. Yeah. Okay. Our friend Siddhartha. Oh yeah. Hi Kelly. Is that you? Yeah. Okay. Me. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry I couldn't be with you in person today. Um, yeah. but I thought I would, uh, tune in and yeah yeah it's like rocker room here i see e <laughs> um, what i wanted to share um thank you for the meditation and just i think i was just um congruent and vibing with your cadence through it and um i really appreciate the reminder to come back come back um just because it is easy to you know drift away and um, I had an unusual experience today. This was my second time <laughs> meditating um, today. And I, um, I was sitting there and what I did was um, focus on the breath. And one of the things I do is uh, that I learned here at um, SF Dharma Collective is um, that, that uh, refrain that uh, goes like, tending to my whole body, I breathe in, tending to my whole body, I breathe out, which I've shared before here, that that really works for me. 
Um, but this time I actually imagined uh, myself as a baby. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I had some, uh, I'm not going to go into any psycho babble or too much trauma memory, but I had a uh, certain circumstances with my birth where I was taken from my mother. So anyway, I just always try to reimagine what that could be like to heal that, you know, and play a new, a new, um, yeah, create a new vision around that. And this time it was me catching the baby being born. Mm, and, I, yeah. and then as I was holding the baby, it wasn't like I'm just have to pay attention to my breath for me, but I had to do it for the baby. And if mm -hmm. I'm breathing for the baby, it just made me so much more intentional and present. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of happened spontaneously. So I just wanted to share that. that uh, yeah, something really, that was really deep. <laughs> That was deep, yeah. And it's almost like something in, internally got integrated that has never been integrated or, or connected. Hmm. Some, so, yeah. That was my experience tonight. Thank you for listening. I feel so moved by that. I'm so grateful you shared with us. Yeah. Yeah. And such a fruit of practice, you know, to have that kind of not looking for, but just that it is interesting, right? Because I think it's Matthew Brensilver. I love, he says, um, meditation is like a disorganized exposure therapy, you know, like you're there and stuff's coming up and you're like, oh God, okay. And, oh my God. Okay. Right. Cause that, right. We're loosening and we're loosening and we're loosening and we're loosening. And there's a lot stored in the body, right. And we are attending to our body and almost like combing through the body, the subtle body with the breath. And so that stuff can come up and emerge and hopefully as, as we could imagine, self-liberate. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Wow. I wish that for all of us. <laughs> um, so tonight, meeting back up with our friend Siddhartha in the woods. Um, so his first, you may remember, he gets into the woods and he cuts off his hair and takes off his jewels and gives it to his kind attendant who is begging with him, one, the one last person to try to keep him in conventional life. You know, please come back to the palace, he says. I'm done, but he still has this really nice clothing on and he encounters uh, a hunter and the hunter is wearing a monk's robe. And he says, why are you wearing a monk's robe? He says, oh, cause the animals are not afraid of me. And so his first benevolent act as Siddhartha in the forest is to trade his beautiful clothing for this monk's robe. He says, I have no use of these clothing and the hunter is glad to give it to him. And then just as he sits down to meditate and has that sunlight coming through upon him, when he opens his eyes, uh, there's a monk there. And the monk is a very kind fellow who teaches him, um, shows him how to gather the wild fruits and edible greens and explains that sometimes it's necessary to dig roots and eat when there are no edible fruits or greens to be found. And this idea, again, that has been woven through this book of this interrelationship with the natural world and, and Siddhartha really, you know, using the forest to literally nourish him. And then they go to visit Master Alara Kal um, Kalama. Um, wow, I misread that for a moment. And this is this is the first teacher that um, Siddhartha really gets to sit with. And he, he describes him this. He says... Um, Master Alara was giving a talk to more than 400 disciples. He looked about 70 years old, so he appeared thin and frail. His eyes shone and his voice resounded like a copper drum. I just love that little description. And on the first day that Siddhartha is really with this community of other monastics who are in, you know, at least 400, he goes into the village um, to go begging for the first time. And one thing that really stri strikes him is he realizes like how much interdependence there is with the spiritual life and the lay life. 
So I'd say it looks by the appearance, I could be wrong, that most of us in this room are lay practitioners and not monastics. Right. And, you know, this interdependence between, you know, folks who are, and I'd even say, especially in this day and age, like temporarily on retreat and kind of taking those temporary monastic vows and then coming back into the lay like life and the support we need all of us to go on retreat. Right. And that we actually can't expect to just go and deepen our spiritual journey without still being deeply intertwined to the rest of the world. That that realization of interdependence is something that comes back so many times on these like last phases towards his enlightenment. Admittedly, it's years, but these last years when he's left the palace towards enlightenment. Um, and so the very the very first instruction that he gets from Master Alara, some of it, um, you know, we see show up right in the Buddha's teaching. So it's not as though, you know, the Buddha created all of these practices, shamatha even, on his own. They existed. It's how he wove them together with a deeper understanding. So we're starting to learn a bit more about how these practices entered his life, how he started using them, and also the limitations that he experienced. So with Master Alara, he says, you know, um, he prostrates in front of him and asks for the teachings. And Alara spoke to Siddhartha about faith and diligence and showed him how to use his breathing to develop concentration. Oh, we just did that. He explained, my teaching is not mere theory. Knowledge is gained from direct experience and attainment, not from mental arguments. In order to attain different states of meditation, it is necessary to rid yourself of all thoughts of past and future. You must focus on nothing but liberation. So it's just interesting, you know, this emphasis on direct experience. Little did uh, Siddhartha know at that time, he would become the Buddha, create many schools of Buddhism, and actually create division among um, Buddhist communities where you have lots of um, monastics or who are practicing, but also many scholars who are just studying the texts and never practicing. So you actually have these divides in communities where there will be, you know, whole groups who really are not doing any direct experience practice. Buddha would literally roll over in his grave if he wasn't reincarnated all the time anyway, um, with this idea that people would make the idea of practice something that's debated, that's reified, that's thrown back and forth. It's really this foundation of having it be the direct experience, right? So, you know, with your question of why practice shamatha, like, what's the theory? Like, okay here's a theory but let's experience it is there clarity can i have this sense of relaxation but also clarity together um and then in order to attain different states of meditation you have to rid yourself of all thoughts of past and future that's a really tall order i think he might have meant to say for at least one second and then one second and then one second again um, and focus on nothing but liberation and i think i've mentioned this before it is it's really radical to think that we could wake up in this lifetime but we should think that I, I believe I, I'm not going to impose that on anyone, but that idea, that's the kind of motivation and energy needed to really dedicate ourselves to even one meditation practice. I believe that, right? If we have that sense that in this lifetime, I could become free of all of this difficult emotional material that gets in the way of me and my awake nature, it gets in the way of me and just showing up with that essential joy and being able to respond, to believe that that's possible and to believe that it's through these practices, that's the motivation. Like every time we practice sitting down and this is the most important thing I can do, I'm gonna wake up in this life. But it can't be phony, right? So it's interesting the kind of emphasis here, you must focus on nothing but liberation. 
you don't need to sell this to Siddhartha, obviously. He's so bought in, like liberation is the only thing. Um, so Siddhartha asked about how to control the body and sensations and then respectfully thanked his teacher and walked away slowly to find a place in the forest. And he goes and kind of makes his little space with that simple, I mean, amazing. That was his entire instruction. And he goes away for a week. Um, and while he was sitting in meditation, he was able to let go of thoughts and even clinging onto past and future. Um, he attained a state of wondrous serenity and rapture. Although he felt seeds of thought and attachment still present in him. Several weeks later, Siddhartha reached a higher state of meditation and the seeds of thought and attachment dissolved. Then he entered a state of concentration in which both rapture and non-rapture ceased to exist. It felt to him as though the five doors of sense perception had completely closed and his heart was still as a lake on a windless day. So this level of such deep absorption in this concentrative practice, which like essentially level nine of shamatha, that you're not being disturbed whatsoever by sounds, by thoughts, you know, any sensations. And what you experience is just this deep stillness. Um, and so he presented the fruits of his practice to Master Alara, and the teacher was impressed. He told Siddhartha he'd made remarkable progress in a short time. And he taught Siddhartha how to realize the meditative state called the realm of limitless space, in which the mind becomes one with infinity. All material and visual phenomena cease to arise, and space is seen as a limitless source of all things. Did anybody get that in practice? Just a little bit tonight? Yeah. Um, really, really, you know, really beautiful high level practice it does, you know, remind me of something, some of the teachings I've received um, in Dzogchen. I, I can't pretend that I've gotten to hang out in the realm of limitless space, but at least this idea of the mind becoming one with infinity, or at least not having a sense of separation between our own conscious experience as existing within this body. And this idea that all material and visual phenomena cease to arise. Again, we're not kind of having these new thoughts and ideas come. There's just this, this expansiveness. Uh, um, and Siddhartha followed the teacher's instructions, concentrate all his efforts on achieving the state. And in less than three days, he succeeded. Remember, he had many lifetimes working up to this, okay? He was working at it. He was working at it. But three days with that instruction. Um, but Siddhartha still felt that even the ability to experience infinite space had not liberated him from his deepest anxieties and sorrows. Dwelling in such a state of awareness, he still felt the hindrances. He returned to our Lara for assistance, and the master told him, you must go one step further. The realm of limitless space is of the same essence as your own mind. It is not an object of your consciousness, but your very consciousness itself. Now go and experience the realm of limitless consciousness. So it's like a little subtle here. And again, uh, I don't think any of us are going to walk away and achieve this in three days, but I would love that. But this idea of imagining the limitless space versus inhabiting this limitless space. Maybe needless to say, he returned to the spot in the, in the forest and was able to experience, realize the realm of limitless consciousness. He saw that his own mind was present in every phenomena in the universe. Um, but even with this attainment, he still felt oppressed by his deepest afflictions and anxieties. So Siddhartha returned to the master and explained his difficulty. The master looked at him with great deep eyes of respect. You're very close to the final goal. Refer, return to your hut and meditate on the illusory nature of all phenomena. Everything in the universe is created by our own mind. Our own mind is the source of all phenomena. Form, sound, smell, taste, and tactile perception. 
such as hot and cold, hard and soft. These are all creations of our mind. They do not exist as we usually think they do. Our consciousness is like an artist painting every phenomena into being. Once you've attained the state of the realm of no materiality, you will have succeeded. So this, this is kind of a familiar teaching to some of us here, this idea of, you know, nothing being of its own um, origination, nothing being kind of um, manifest in its own right. It's the way that we are experiencing everything, that our own mind creates all phenomena, that that's even a higher level of realization than merging in some ways with an infinite space. And it's interesting because it's, it's conceptual, right? He's giving Siddhartha these really conceptual instructions on how is it that we can really start to kind of pierce through the perceptions of the world that often get in the way. And then, you know, he was believing would help Siddhartha be free from these hindrances. The way I understand, especially this part and just the next teacher he sees is a lot of the instructions on developing concentration, coming into that deep sense of um, awareness of awareness. It helps you leave this world. It helps you leave the troubles that are kind of manifest in our day-to-day -day existence. But then once you open your eyes and you're not meditating, it hasn't gotten underneath. It hasn't kind of really pierced through the duality of our existence or the ways that we kind of are always reliving much of our um, kind of early wounding and other material. And Siddhartha keeps looking for with these teachers, a way to get underneath those deeper kind of seeds um, of our own suffering. So he goes and he, he continues um, to practice this now trying on this realm of no materiality, seeing through all phenomena. Um, and in a month, this time it took him a month, he, he really achieved it. And happy to have teached this state of awareness, he spent the following weeks trying to use it to dissolve the deepest obstructions in his mind and heart. But although the realm of no materiality was a profound state of meditation, it too was unable to help him. So he goes back. And this time, um, Master Alara says, is like super impressed and says, this is all I have to teach you. This is the greatest of what I have to offer. Please join me and teach this community with me. You have attained everything I've attained. And Siddhartha is like, I didn't come here to teach a community. Um, and I, I need, I still need to find my way to true liberation. And so his, his path continues. The next teacher he meets, um, let's see here. Oh, we're on chapter 13. In chapter 14, um, it's interesting. There's like a small aside. Sometimes there are these stories that feel very kind of placed in, but Siddhartha runs into this young king who we'll meet later who finds him super impressive. So now Siddhartha has sun attainment, right? He has the, these deeper states of consciousness. So we can imagine he's starting to move through the world in a different way. He's not yet like the enlightened Buddha, but he's attained such a deep quiet and sense of peace and calm. And this king sees him begging um, door to door in his kingdom and goes and follows Siddhartha, and like kind of propositions him and says, come be my best friend. I know that being with you, I'll be wiser. I'll give you half my kingdom. Um, you get these offers that Siddhartha gets. And, you know, he has to humbly refuse, but he promises to come back to the king and to teach him what he has learned when he, when he figures out the way. And there's an interesting um, aspect here too. At this time, there are, you know, these group of ascetics and the way that they're practicing their spirituality is by what is called at the time mortification of the body so really this idea that the only way to spend higher spiritual realms is by completely kind of like 
starving the body, right? Giving the body nothing. That, that's going to, uh, and he first says, um, he really says to them, he, he thinks that that practice is, is, is completely um, kind of not pointless, but not useful. He says, even if you are reborn in heaven, the suffering on earth will remain unchanged. To seek the ways to find a solution to life suffering, not to escape life. Granted, we cannot accomplish much if we pamper our bodies like those who live in sensual pleasure, but abusing our bodies is no more helpful. So we're seeing here like him trying to navigate and understand all these other spiritual communities and what people are doing. The next teacher he meets is Master Udaka, and it's almost exactly the same thing where he learns from this master. He gets maybe one more aspect of concentration, um, the state of neither perception nor non-perception. Um, but again, feels like it's not getting underneath the root causes of suffering. And the, again, the master says, join me, teach my sangha with me. And he says, I got to go. But at this point, Siddhartha is getting a little bit of a reputation. And some of the other students of this master, they're really sad to see him go. And they actually follow him a couple of weeks later into the forest. And this is the time in which um, Siddhartha decides that what he really needs to do is take what he's learned and practice by himself. Interestingly, he goes back and decides that uh, he remembers how he advised the ascetics to not abuse their bodies, telling him it would only add to the suffering of a world already filled with suffering. But now he considered their path more carefully. He thought to himself, you can't make fire with soft, wet wood. The body is the same. If physical desires are not mastered, it's difficult for the heart to attain enlightenment. I'll practice self-mortification in order to attain liberation. So he goes into this intense self-mortification, including... Um, on dark nights, he entered the deepest and most wild reaches of the forest, the mere thought of which was enough to make a person's hair stand on end. And it's funny, I like this idea, like sometimes we get this idea, which I, I relate to on retreat, we want things really nice, <laughs> right? We want it to be quiet, we want there to be, you know, want to be warm. And he's like, I'm going to go to the hardest place. That's what's going to teach me. And this idea that he could really learn, um, if he could learn how to make his body not respond to fear, you know, so he'd say he thought there were demons with the wrestling sound, um, you know, that a python was coming to kill him, but he just wouldn't move, just maintaining the stillness of body. I think the closest I'll get in, in, in our sangha to <laughs> inviting us to do that is not to scratch the itch during practice, but this idea of like, can we hold with the desire? Can we really have a sense of, oh, I have such a strong desire. What's it like to just watch desire move through the body instead of kind of move towards it immediately? So that's a lot of his practice. And um, he, he goes into this for quite a while. And then at some point he started, you know, even the people who'd come to practice with him were a little alarmed. Um, he stopped, he stopped eating almost altogether. And, and then one day while practicing his meditation in a cemetery, Siddhartha realized with a, with a jolt, how wrong the path of self mortification was. The sun had set and a cool breeze gently caressed his skin after sitting all day beneath the blazing sun, the breeze was delightfully refreshing and Siddhartha experienced an ease in his mind, unlike anything he'd felt during the day. He realized that the body and mind formed one reality, which could not be separated. The peace and comfort of the body were directly related to the peace and comfort of the mind. To abuse the body was to abuse the mind. So this is a big next step for him essentially you know it's one of the last kind of gates for him before he wakes up in the next chapter and this idea of um he says that um when he's thinking of these other meditations he felt that the goal had always been to find a way to escape the world and, in the, and that included the world of sensation and perception. But he thought that 
why fear the joyful ease that meditation brings? Such joys have nothing in common with the five categories of desire which obscure awareness. To the contrary, the joys of meditation can nourish body and mind and provide the strength needed to pursue the path to enlightenment. That's why we did the joy practice this evening. I And it's really sweet, again, to just kind of see him like circling around. I think in our contemporary day, it's, it's a little different. You know, people might get like all in for one therapeutic technique for a while and they're like this is it i am like internal family systems or die or nonviolent communication cbt psychedelic therapy it's this or that's nothing else and any of them i think can have benefit and it's interesting how he is using the teachings and then finding the space for himself to integrate them and i think we all need that even though we're now following his teachings, my guess is his suggestion would be, yeah, use them as needed and like integrate them. But I think some of the essential pieces here, especially as he's waking up, is this, we have to live through our bodies. The practice is alive in our bodies and awakening is in our bodies. And I think there's been a little misinterpretation with meditation that it's supposed to be a liberation of the mind and that the mind is above, you know, um, the neck and that awakening through the whole body just feels so rich. So, yes. Thank you all. Um, we'll be, oh, we have announcements. We'll do a dedication first, and then we'll do announcements here. So let's just take a moment. It feels comfortable to have your hands in front of your chest. Again, reminding ourselves of this shared, beautiful, simple aspiration coming here in order to wake up our hearts for the sake of all beings. And if there's any benefit that has come from our time here together tonight, imagine dedicating that or sending that, our collective energy towards the realization so that all beings could know peace and ease. All beings could feel belonging. All beings could heal and love and be loved. All beings could be free.